This is your invitation to leap ahead in your engineering career. The inaugural Product Development Expo, PDX, happening in Phoenix, Arizona on Tuesday, May 14th, 2024, brings you face to face with the engineering elite. These aren't just any speakers, they're the industry's highest performing product development engineers, ready to share the methods and strategies that have defined their success. Imagine learning design for manufacturability from those who've redefined it, diving deep into tolerance analysis with pioneers, exploring novel engineering applications for Excel, and unlocking unique 3D printing strategies all in one place. These high-caliber engineers will open their playbooks, offering practical, hands-on lessons forged over decades in the trenches of innovation. Don't miss out on this unparalleled opportunity to absorb the wisdom of those who've led the charge in engineering breakthroughs. PDX is your chance to not just meet but learn directly from these legends of engineering. Mark the date, May 14th, 2024, in Phoenix. Elevate your skills, ignite your creativity, and join a community of growth-minded engineering professionals at PDX. Learn more at teampipeline.us forward slash PDX. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we are privileged to be speaking with Derek Harper. Derek is a seasoned professional in the biomedical engineering field with a, a rich history of innovation and leadership. Derek's career has spanned various roles and has been instrumental in developing and introducing groundbreaking medical devices and technologies. Engineers listening to this episode will gain valuable insights from Derek's experiences, learning about the challenges and triumphs of engineering in the medical field, leadership, and the intersection of engineering, innovation, and market needs. Derek, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Aaron. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So, Derek, tell me, what made you decide to become an engineer? Well, I'd say the first thing would be just the aptitude for science and math. And beyond that, it was my uh, desire to understand how things worked, whether it be the human body or a bicycle or an automobile, just kind of like what most engineers might feel is just the desire to understand how things work, why things work, and just the drive to uh, understand and the drive of knowledge. I remember listening to you say that it brings to mind uh, when I was, I don't know, maybe nine or 10, I had this, this like crummy old, old school FM radio, you know, the kind with the little dial on it. Uh, and I had, there's a little headphone jack, right? So I'd plug my headphones in I, and I could listen to it. It was just this crummy old thing, right? And, and one day I took the back off of it because I was curious to see what it looked like on the inside. And I took the back off and, and I was just kind of messing around with the, the, uh, headphone jack. And I, I, I learned that if I put it in just the right place, touching a couple of these metal contacts inside that uh, they had no indication that they were associated with the actual headphone. Uh, receptacle, but I learned that if I, I touched just the right metal parts inside with the the headphone jack, I could hear the audio. And I thought it was like the coolest thing ever that I had found another way to listen to the audio that was admittedly way more difficult than the jack that was you know built in, designed into the radio. But just that that uh, that act of like discovery, right? It was so thrilling to me, and and I think that's that's kind of what you're saying right now. That's exactly what I'm saying, and. That's a more uh, advanced level of acquiring knowledge of how something might work. But it's as simple as pulling the electric cord halfway out of the socket and dropping a, a coin, uh, shorting out the two things and realizing, <laughs> uh oh, well, that might not have been a good idea. But and following my father around, whatever he was doing, whatever project he was doing in the house, whether it be 
out in the yard, plumbing, electrical, going to the hardware store. I had that innate desire to learn how things work, learn how to fix things. And interestingly, my brother, who was fairly close to me in age, never wanted to do that. So I think that the it, it's clear early on when someone wants to be an engineer versus you know a close relative like my brother who really didn't have any interest in that yeah when you have the neck no this this uh you mentioned dropping a coin on a plug that had been pulled halfway out does that come from personal experience yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> that, that is great do you remember what appliance was plugged in and what shorted out <laughs> i think it might have been um a clock radio <laughs> discovery yeah discovery i learned probably shouldn't do that anymore <laughs> all right well can can you think of or was there even a uh, a pivotal moment in your career that kind of helped shape your trajectory in the engineering field. Okay, well, there are two. Um, I, I one came to mind immediately, but then there's another one prior to that. Um, it my desire to understand the human body, all of its inner workings, why it did what it did, why are what are thoughts, how is that stored in our brain. Um, everything how does the muscle contract and what are bones all of that that was a big part of my upbringing and i considered going to medical school um and there were two things that drove me away from wanting to go to medical school one being a family friend who said it's not going to be the same in the future you're going to end up working for a company uh basically an insurance company and it's going to be more managed care. So, uh, that advice is what drove me away from the career of medicine to biomedical engineering. Um, so that was number one that helped drive me in the engineering field, um, initially. And then I'd say the next thing that really shaped my career would be that I started with a small startup company um, pretty much right out of college and was forced to learn everything from design to manufacturing to quality to designing molds. We, we were a very vertically integrated company, which was not very common back in the day and certainly isn't uh, very common these days because everybody's into outsourcing things. But I think the small company that forced me to learn a very broad base of most tasks that go into designing, developing, manufacturing, and selling medical devices, I'd say that the choice of going with a small company, one that needed and encouraged their engineering team to learn as much about the whole process. And that was huge. Learning as many things as I could early on allowed me to speak multiple languages. And I think these languages are talking to the machine shop, talking to the designers, talking to the marketing people, talking to the salespeople, and even getting to the point quickly within six, nine months of starting my job. Um, I was out in the field as one of the two key technical experts that were allowed and asked to talk to the surgeons. It was a neurosurgery uh, focused company. So I think, um, that kind of is a more than just one key answer, but the, yeah. the small nature of the startup allowed me to learn quickly and broaden my scope. Whereas if I had should chosen to go with a much larger company, I would have had a narrow responsibility. Um, 
framework? I think that's a really huge insight, uh, being able to work for a small company where you have to wear a lot of hats and the increased knowledge and experience that brings. For engineers who might be listening to this, who maybe are working at a bigger company and their role is a little bit narrower, is there anything that you can suggest that might help them approach the more varied experience that you would gain at a smaller company or or is the suggestion just consider going to work for a smaller company? Uh, I think it might be just going to work for a smaller company. Um, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of working at two small startups that were later acquired by large um, global manufacturer medical device companies. And those companies, whether it be in year 1996 when the first company acquired us and all the way up to 2016 the second time that that uh event happened in my career they both are um so large that they don't really want someone to have such broad responsibility everybody has a task everybody has a responsibility and I think it's I think it's good. It's fine, but if we're trying to develop an engineer's career, they do need to be exposed to all aspects of the company and especially the customer end. I think the customer end is key. It's key yeah. to it's key to everything. It's key to understanding what the customer needs are. It's key to understanding the language they speak, it's key to um, being in a position of information gathering, knowledge development, and being able to set the course for what changes might need to be made to current products and what products might be developed next. I think that's very important. Yeah, totally. Can you think of... um a situation in your career where there was a failure or, or a setback of some sort and how it contributed to your growth as an engineer? Yes, um, a number of them. And let's just start with one um, that I think is a basic um, tenant of developing a product. Um the second company that I mentioned was that was acquired by a large medical device company. We had three sounding surgeons, um, three very talented, very smart uh, surgeons driving the direction of the product development. And my partner engineer and I listened carefully. We did multiple labs with them. We went through multiple iterations and developed a, a great product. Um, showed it to a few other people during that process and quickly uh, gained FDA 510k clearance for the product. And then we went to a trade show and launched it. Everything's going great. Um, first 20, 30 implants happened, maybe first 50 implants. And um, we started getting feedback that the device size was not optimal for a new technique that was being promoted in the field. And at first, we didn't really understand how that could be. And we asked our three surgeons, and they just minimized, oh, no, no, no. That's not right. This is the way to go. That surgeon, the other surgeon, the two surgeons you're hearing that from, they're really a small little niche. Well, that wasn't true. It was a rapidly growing niche of surgeons who were adopting this new approach to implanting the device into the space where it was going in the body. And we quickly had to come up with a smaller device that worked just as well as the previous one. And luckily, um, Kevin uh, turned something around real quick 
and we got something approved again, uh, not approved, but cleared for market. And we were able to survive that false start pretty well. But what it taught us, reminded us, is that the sample size of customers that must be interviewed, um, asked about the the market potential, the product, um, review the product, use it in a lab, it must be pretty large. You have to go from the thought-leading surgeons who travel around the world uh, training their peers to the high-volume surgeon who is a community doctor, which one of our founders was, and all the way down to the new MD, surgeon, physician, or customer, if it's not a medical device, who's just getting going because um, markets are always changing, techniques are always changing, and that's whether you're designing something for a snowboarder or an automobile or a medical device in our case. So I think that was a huge lesson that we were able to circumnavigate the problem quickly but it could have been disastrous because we were a startup company with limited funding at that time, and we needed great results to give confidence to our investors um, that we knew what we were doing. And that was an expensive, you know, time-wise, it was an expensive deal, but we circumnavigated it okay and came out fine, but it was a good lesson. So when... Uh, these surgeons were were leading your team, and like you mentioned, surgeons, uh, as a general rule, are, are very intelligent, highly capable people in our societies. And, and it can be, I think, kind of challenging or, or daunting to to challenge them on anything. How were you able to, or or maybe even in general, how do you suggest that engineers who are working with docs, surgeons, how do you suggest they frame their communication in a way that doesn't come across as confrontational or, you know, at all threatening to the surgeon? That's a very important question and problem that is faced in this field, as you mentioned, and um, especially when they're the co-founders of the company. Um, it wasn't okay just to say, um, I think you're wrong. <laughs> We're going to go do this and we're not going to pay attention to your combined 30 plus years of experience in this industry. So what we ended up doing was we got a lot of feedback and we're able to, with evidence, go show them that, Hey, this is a, um, this is not a, we have to do this and cancel the existing product. It's just, we're going to do both. Mm. So we didn't, we didn't exactly tell them, we have to redesign it and obviate this first product and go with the other. And we just said, we're going to do both. And we kept both for about 12 to 18 months and then uh, wound down the original design so that it was not, um, it, it wasn't a either or my way or your way. All right, let me take just a short break here and share with the listeners that our company, Pipeline Design and Engineering, develops new and innovative manufacturing processes for complex products, then implements them into manual fixtures or fully automated machines to dramatically reduce production costs and improve production yields for OEMs. Today, we're speaking with Derek Harper. So, Derek, you've been a leader in the medical device space for, for quite a while. What are some of the strategies that you found most effective for leading and, and motivating engineering teams? I would say that hiring the right people for the job right away is uh, key. And then once you get the right people who have the desire and the drive to take, to do what it takes to develop a product from the napkin all the way into commercial release. Um, it truly is treating everybody with respect and having a unified team. I tried to make everybody 
feel involved in every part of the process. Um, communication about what we were doing, what our vision was, what the plan was, um, was important. So I think sharing the vision of what the goal was, where we were going and why we were doing it and teaching everybody from the warehouse people to the engineers, to the quality people, why we were doing it, what the importance is of this device. And uh, in previous company, when there were production people making the product, working at the same company, I would teach the assemblers the importance of the device, what it did, why it was important, what would happen if it failed, what would happen if it was dirty, um, what if therefore non-sterile. So I think trying to be a, a leader who is willing to educate and involve in the process is something that works really well. Um, there are those who lead by intimidation and fear and expect everybody to just jump and uh, respond when directives are given. I've never found that to work for me. And the teams that I've developed responded well when they were involved in the process. And they're more willing to get on board when there's a uh, something that has to be done quickly, like a product redesign, which I mentioned earlier. It's like, uh-oh, okay, yep, new knowledge. We got to go out and figure this out. So... That means some weekends, that means some extra time, that means a lot of stress and pressure for a little bit. Um, but I think that is the strategy that I used the most and that worked the best. Yeah, I, I agree 100% on um, making people feel involved, sharing all of the relevant information as opposed to this fear-based leadership, if you can call it that leadership. I, I had a... Um, I, I've just, that's, that's always made sense to me. And it, it has always surprised me, shocked me really, when I hear about situations in which there's a manager or a boss who, who, who leads based on fear. You know, he, he, he gets angry, he yells. In fact, I had a boss like that for a short time, a long time ago. This is right after I got laid off and started my own company. I was doing some contract work for another company. And the owner of this company, it was a small, small company, automation place. And uh, this, this owner would almost on a weekly basis, you could count on him just flying off the handle and, and he would yell and scream and demand things. And it, it was just, it was shocking to me that first of all, any adult would behave like that. But second of all, an adult who's trying to lead a team would behave like that. And, and, uh, I, I think you can probably guess how loyal his engineers were to him, right? N not, not loyal at all. Like, n no one, no one liked the guy. We didn't want to, we certainly didn't want to go the extra mile for the guy. Um, just, just incredible that, uh, that people can, can behave like that. But there are people out that, out there like that, which is, again, just shocking to me. There are people like that. And some of them are very successful. Like you're, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are supposedly that type of leader, but mm, um, interesting. I, I don't think that works for me. Um, I can learn as much from the entire team. Um, and I try to learn something every day. And just because I'm in a leadership position doesn't mean I need to be less than human and dictatorial in my approach. And of course, there are times when maybe I'm having a bad day or a circumstance might dictate uh, more discipline in an approach. But in general, the best way I found to do that and to motivate people is to teach them why we're doing something. It's one thing to tell them what we're going to do and what the goals are, but why? Why would we want to do this? Is it really necessary? 
And I think that that goes a long way, treating people with respect and asking them to come along for the ride and maybe give more than they're ready to give. And they might do it if they're treated well. Absolutely. Yeah. We have a governing principle here that is um, governed by invitation, not compulsion. And I don't, to my knowledge, no one at Pipeline has ever been compelled to do anything. Of course, at the end of the day, you can never really compel someone to do something, but you can yell and you can threaten and you can try to use fear. Um, and there have been times that the team here has gone just way, way, way above and beyond, you know, what, what should be expected of them. And it's, they've done it of their own volition. And, and I think it's because we have this wonderful culture where, there, uh, there's no compulsion. There, people are treated with respect. They're treated like adults, not children, and allowed to make decisions for themselves. And uh, it's just kind of a magic place. Everyone gets along. They all support each other, and people do what needs to be done to to get the job done. And it's it's a really wonderful place to work. Little toot there for uh, for pipeline. Yeah, congratulations. That's great. I love hearing stories like that, and it's obviously working because you have. Quite a facility, quite a team, and um, from what I can see and what you've shown me, you've done some amazing things. So your team is doing great. So you're doing a good job of it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, uh, given your experience with with medical devices and and uh, that industry, what what emerging trends do you think we'll we'll be seeing in the next five to ten years? I think in the biomedical engineering field especially with devices, I think the the biologics um, aspect of marrying devices to interact with the human body, whether that be with mm. biomimicry, which I've had the pleasure of doing, uh, having a you know product that we developed um, for rotator cuff repair. It's probably my favorite project of all time um, to some of these uh, brain chips that are going in to help people see or respond to text messages. If they have ALS, I saw something recently just last week that um, not Elon Musk company, but the there's another one that is implanting chips. It's actually on a stent that goes in the, into a vein in the brain and it somehow is um, sensing the brain waves uh, based on an input you know it's, they're eliciting a response uh, from the person's vision or their touch or their hearing and they're able to kind of interpret what it is by this antenna that's basically implanted in their vein in their brain and it's just crazy so i think that the interface between the human body um, and these devices is going to be the future you you mentioned this project um just now that you were very proud of maybe it's this one or, or maybe it's a different one but can you discuss a project that that you're particularly proud of and um, the, the impact it had either either on you or, or the patients or the company? Yes, um, it, it is the one uh, that I mentioned that I'm most proud of. And um, most rotator cuff repairs and most tendon to bone repairs that happen, when a tendon tears away from the bone, the easiest thing to do is to suture it back to the bone and let it heal. Uh, unfortunately, it heals as a scar, and it's never quite the same as the original tended bone um, connection um, that Mother Nature gave us. So there's an advancing field, and it's been going on for decades um, and luckily for us, there was a lot of prior art in the literature that allowed us to leverage um, everything that they had done with biomimetic scaffolds. Um, this is basically, it's kind of like a Gore-Tex graft, but um, it is um, 
microfiber all the way down to nanofiber diameter fibers, nano size and micro size uh, fibers um, that are either aligned or they can be cross-linked as you know, skin tissue is cross-linked. Tendons and ligaments are aligned like string cheese. And the theory is, is that you can teach the fibroblasts and osteoblasts to lay down their tissue alongside this. Um, you can do it with collagen. You can do it with polymers, um, these little fibers. And you teach the body how to lay it down. And it builds around it. And then the scaffold resorbs. And theoretically, you have a um, more natural, stronger, durable bone tendon interface. And we started researching it. And um, one would think that this would be a very difficult thing to get approved by the FDA. Um, we found a creative way um, around that, so to speak, but it wasn't tricky. It was just um, a way to get it approved. And we weren't able to make any major claims until we came out with a study that showed what it did, but at least we were able to get it on the market. And um, this is a little piece of polylactic glycolic acid, PLGA, that is electrospun, and it's less than half a millimeter thick, um, maybe a square centimeter in diameter, maybe a little less than that, or not diameter, but in surface area, and um, was in 80% air. But the body um, was able to recognize a structure like the extracellular matrix. There's collagen fibers in bone. There's collagen fibers in skin and muscles. And so we were mimicking what that tendon to bone interface might look like. And this is not yet proven. I don't think anybody's come out with a, um, a study that says this is the absolute way to go. And maybe it'll be, uh, a fifth generation beyond what we did, but I was uh, excited about it because we were the first in this field of orthopedics to, to do it and get it commercialized. Wow. That's phenomenal. What a appealing that must've been to complete the project and see it, it being deployed in patients. Yes. It's one of the, one of the more rewarding things in medical devices is to see the product actually be used in a patient and implanted. Um, that one was rewarding. Um, some of the other ones we did, uh, you know, it's nerve wracking. It's like, okay, we've seeing that first implant uh, go in a patient. It's nerve wracking. It's like, oh my gosh, this is a real patient. Please work. Please work. Please don't break. Please work. <laughs> but by the time we had gotten to this particular product, it was um, it was more joyful than anything. A little nerve wracking. Wow. But. All right. Well, just a, a couple more questions, and we'll wrap things up here. Uh, what advice would you give to young engineers who are aspiring to contribute to the the biomedical engineering field, the medical devices space? Learn as much as you can about as many things as you can and get as close to the customer as you can. There's a lot of, a lot of knowledge at that customer company interface that can't be replaced. And I think that engineers are sometimes left out of that discussion. And uh, it's, those discussions are performed by marketing people. But I think it's crucial to have the the eyes and the ears and the senses, all senses of an engineer reading body language. I think it's very important. So I would I'd learn as much as you could about everything that helps you do your current job. And then I'd try to get as close to the customer as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Define the problem really well by talking with the end user. Well, I was saying that 
I have this personal mission of accelerating the speed of engineering. And I wonder, has there been a situation in your career where you have found a way to do just that, to accelerate the speed of engineering? Uh, And of course, this is not just, you know, trying to force your team to work more hours. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about Uh, a new tool or a new technique or a new mindset even that really moves the needle in in terms of how quickly devices or or products can be engineered and developed? Well, I think for me going back to the early 2000s timeframe, the biggest thing was rapid prototyping, stereolithography. That was huge. I can't even imagine how things ever got done without rapid prototyping. And now you can rapid (laughs) prototype a mold to get, uh, you know, an end product. So um, it's really uh, advancing. I mean, you can do stereolithography with different materials and they're implanting some of these materials. You can do it with metals. And I would say in the future, AI might be something that we can get better at using. And if we don't, we're going to be left behind. Um, I think the, you know, knowledge is power. Information is power. And um, there were things that I've done recently that I didn't know quite how to do. And instead of having to rely on another expert, I was able to ask the right questions of just general AI platforms. And they taught me basically how to do it. Um, an engineer can problem solve, some, problem solve themselves out of and into, uh, out of a bad situation into a good situation. So it's, Usually we can learn pretty quickly. And I think from just an information standpoint, AI is already there. But I think in the future, from the design aspect, it's going to be essential to keep up with all of the advancements so that there might be a way to, not might be, there are ways to do design iterations in AI that make it easier to do simulations and i think that that's some that's an area where i'm not yet um i'm feeling a little behind in and i think the people who are ahead of ahead of the curve on that one are going to be successful i like that you mentioned ai i think it's obviously a powerful tool and super interesting too We have taken all of the transcripts. One example of how we're using AI. We've taken all of the transcripts of the Being an Engineer podcast. So there are 200 plus transcripts, episodes that we've had. And we've uploaded these as PDF documents into a chat GPT agent. And we, it's called BAE podcast analyst, BAE being an engineer. And it's, it's out there. Uh, available to the public right now. If you have a, a ChatGPT Plus subscription, then you can access this agent. And what it allows you to do is query the agent, effectively querying the responses of over 200 uh, high-performing senior-level engineers, and you can ask it questions. And it will give you answers based on what these engineers have actually said in the podcast. So there's a lot of information there. You can imagine how much, uh, how many answers have been generated by over 200 engineers being interviewed over the past four years. And, and that's one of the ways that, that we've been using AI here. Uh, and it's out there for free right now. So all of you listening, you can uh, go to chat GPT and, and search in the, the agents for BAE podcast analyst and, and check that out. If you don't, especially if you don't have a direct access to to a mentor where you work, this can be a great um, uh, another option for uh, a mentor. Of course, it, it's probably not going to replace an actual you know live person mentor, but it, it's a wonderful supplement and, and a great place to start 
that's really easy and you can use anytime, anywhere. Um, so, so there's my there's my plug for this little tool that that we've put together. Again, we're not charging anything for it. It's just out there to hopefully enrich the engineering community. I love that. Well, Derek, yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a really, I mean, OpenAI has just done tremendous things for everyone. That uh, really cool stuff. Um, I think we'll we'll wrap things up there, Derek. Thank you so much again for for being on the show today. Um, I can't wait to see what you and and your your group of engineers work on next. <laughs> well, thank you, Aaron. This has been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Derek. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.